you know, I'm really happy to, to, to talk with you and speak with you this morning. Thank and you. Thank as I was saying, Robert, I'm really, I like to focus on not the perspiration of writing a tome he's written, because I know how hard and arduous it is, but the inspiration behind it and what his target, what his audience was. So, um, you know, you've labored on this. It's a lonely, long process. At night, come to bed, come to bed, your wife yells, you know, and your kids, you know, get in the morning, they move the pages around or whatever, even on the, on the, on the word processor. So you've got to have a lot of um, gumption just to get through it. It's like a stagecoach ride. First you love it, oh, it's beautiful, and then suddenly you take all you care about is getting there. So I'm curious, what was the inspiration for writing the book? So, so number one, thank you for having me here, and thanks for doing this. Um, so number one, the, uh, so I had help, okay? So everybody I, has help. Yeah, everybody's got <laughs> help, but I had a really good help, Mani over here, Mani Pelon, who's my co-writer, and he's, he's our speechwriter, and, and uh, you know, we, we do, because we're in the midst of um, sort of a pretty significant media disruption, um, uh, and you know, we're, we're one of the companies that is making the disruption happen, um, we get asked to go and talk to the management teams of our partners, whether they're media agencies, whether they're big brands like you know, Coca-Cola or Pepsi or, or P&G, et cetera, uh, or uh, accounting companies, BBC, Sony, you know, anybody. So everybody wants to, to understand how we think about things, what we do. So we end up going to lots of different board meetings, management offsites, et cetera. And for each of those, Mani has to write a speech for somebody, you know, <laughs> talking points. So we've been, you know, doing that quite a lot. And, uh, and, and one time, this was, I think, two years ago, Mani was saying, you know, why don't you just write a book? This is too much work over and over. Why don't you just write a book, and every time somebody asks you to do something like this, just send them the book, uh -huh. and they can read it, and that's it. And, and I'm just kind of like going through my calendar and how busy I'm all day long. It's like, yeah, yeah great idea. Um, but you know what, I'll do it if you do it with me. And Mani was like, yeah, I would. So, uh, so that's how it was born, and because Mani has, you know, this is not like starting to work with somebody who has no domain expertise. He's got all the contacts, you know, working with, uh, with, uh, with the executives. Uh, so it became an incredibly easy collaboration because it's just we're writing about what we do every day and uh, with, with tremendous amount of domain expertise. So, so it, it actually uh, became, I, I think, easier than in other cases. Yeah, but you know, inspiration isn't the amount, it's just that moment, that, that epiphany, that, that moment where you say, I have a message to give yep. and a benefit yep. to give, a render, not just the features of ink and, or zeros and ones. It That's was right. something in the inspiration. I, you know, yep. and there, all, any business is collaborative, every enterprise is collaborative, no matter how singular it seems, you're always engaging with people for interactivity. But I'm curious, you know, what was the <clears throat> inspiration that you wanted to give, the benefit you wanted to give to your audience who read the book. Sure. So, so the main inspiration, and, and that's the same inspiration for our meetings and interactions with media companies or, or brands, et cetera, is there are three things. One, uh, today uh, we find ourselves in an age where everybody's talking about movies and TV shows, formats that have been around for decades, being transmitted through the internet. So it's not about the innovation on the content, it's just innovation on means of delivery. What's happening on YouTube is innovation on means of delivery as well as on the content. Meaning there are so many different types of formats which have uh, uh, popped up on YouTube and so many new storytellers right. who have popped up on YouTube. Uh, it, this is much greater uh, change that's happening on YouTube than it's happening anywhere else. So we wanted to give that insight because all the media attention is on movies and TV shows, same formats, coming through the internet. Okay, that's it. And for us, it's new storytellers, new, new formats. That's number one. Number two, uh, that these storytellers, and we call them stream punks, are building uh, really large businesses, both online as well as offline. Uh, the ones who are really, really thoughtful and, and smart, they, they build uh, little empires on a global basis. And a great example of that is uh, Michelle Phan, uh, you know, vlogger around makeup, uh, eventually built her own makeup line, and eventually built a subscription company that delivers makeup to people called Ipsy. Uh, which most recently raised you know, uh, $100 million at $500 million valuation. And all of this started from YouTube. And, and I can go on and on. There's a chapter seven, Jenny Doan from Missouri Star Quilt Company, uh, uh, a lady in her 50s, so not a 20-year-old YouTube star vlogger, a lady in her 50s who quilts, 
who built an empire around quilting out of Hamilton, Missouri. The most unbelievable story that has happened. Missouri. Yeah, Missouri. Sorry. <laughs> you may live there. You may think it's Missouri. <laughs> That's Missouri. And, uh, Sorry, I couldn't help that. So, so, and, and you've seen this over and over, that people are just building these incredible businesses around it on a global basis. And the third one is that it's not just for young people. And as Jenny Doan from, from the Missouri Starphone uh, <laughs> Cult Company is proving, you can do it at any age. So, so that's really the inspiration for the book. Different storytellers in different formats, building global media empires, and it's for people of any age. Okay, so you're a disruptor, you're an innovator, you're a leader. Uh, maybe upset with this question. Why do you choose an old traditional means like ink and paper to tell the story? I mean, it's like, it seems like an oxymoron. Let's do it a different way because we have different audiences. Why did you choose the arduous, definitely arduous, lugubrious, definitely lugubrious process of writing a book? Um, well, we, we tell our story every single day uh, through YouTube. Right? So all of the YouTube stars, they tell how they made it. So this is like, you know, my favorite line is that nobody knows how Tom Cruise made it. Everybody knows how any YouTube stars made it because they tell them, they tell their fans. Right. So, so the stardom on YouTube is attainable. Okay. It's relatable and attainable. Stardom in Hollywood isn't because it, you know, it was anointed by Peter. And, yeah, and don't that, <laughs> it works like that. So, uh, so the, uh, our story is being told every single day and our PR department tells it every day. You, just like I say that the, the stream punks are building cross media businesses, we have to have cross media strategy. So, and why, why not do a book? I love reading books myself. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a, it's a fun process to go through. It's great for us to be on the creation side, you know, because I'm always on the side where we're, you know, buying content and negotiating for rights deals, et cetera. And instead here, we're like pitching ourselves to a publisher and we're pitching ourselves to an agent and, you know, we're, we're the creator. So it's actually a really uh, great process for us to go through. Cool. It makes us better at our jobs. I'm moving to a slightly different subject. It's still called show business, not show show, you know? And so there's always an economic engine in, the, in, in it. And in the movie and television and music business, you know, even though the artists complain so many times, they would say, show me the money, because they would have this hit and you'd read the articles in the paper about, you know, it's been playing for four years, and including Afghanistan, and it's to $800 million, and where are my net profits, or where are my profits? Yeah. And so that was always a question. That was the choke point. It was distribution. They controlled the distribution. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was, it was an oligarchy, at least. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a monarchy, but, uh, <laughs> one could say. But now uh, YouTube broke that, breaks that down. Isn't there a cry? How, how do you avoid the cry of the artist on the front end of the food chain, talking to the audience through your method, saying, show me the money? How do they make money? So. Uh I'm going to back up a little bit so that because I'll make anyway, references to, to, to it a lot. Uh, I think the best way to think about the media industry, like we live in an incredibly confusing time for media because uh, all of the media up until the internet came around was born in a disconnected age, mm -hmm. which means when something is disconnected, it has limited shelf space. When you have limited shelf space, you know, whether it's Walmart shelves, whether it's a grid on, on Comcast, whether it's a TV schedule, everything is limited shelf space, which means there is somebody in the suit auctioning off that limited shelf space to a whole bunch of people who want to get in. And, uh, and that happens at every step of, of the process of movie or TV show creation and distribution all the way to the consumer, which is why the business became, which is why there's so many fancy restaurants in New York and LA, <laughs> because you had to, like, that's where the, the, the auction would happen, right, pretty much every single time. Right. So the business became an incredibly B2B optimized, business to business optimized uh, business. And um, then the in internet comes around and turns everything upside down and suddenly takes the notion of scarcity and removes it, because you have unlimited show space. Whether it's on the internet, you can post any blog that you want, you can, you know, like, you can write any article that you want, you know, on Medium, you can post videos on YouTube, Facebook, you know, anywhere you want. Suddenly, in unlimited show space. And so what it's doing, it's taking the core skill set of Hollywood and making it not as relevant, mm -hmm. right? which was the B2B optimization and, and leverage. So suddenly, it doesn't become about B2B and becomes about B2C, business to consumer. So the people who learn how to talk to consumers 
and how to build brands and, and, and connect with consumers become the winners of the internet age. And, and that could be companies, you know, whether it's YouTube, Netflix, etc. You know, we have data on our consumers. We make sure we're recommending all the right, right things to them. Whether you're a content creator and you, you know how to get your audience, you become incredibly powerful, and then you can build up all these sort of multifaceted businesses. So I, I like to call the disconnected age. The, uh, I, I, I like to call it uh, Switzerland, because yeah. it was incredibly well organized, well zoned. Everybody did really, really well. And I like to call the, the connected age the world India, because it's messy, but vibrant and really big and growing incredibly fast. And all of us are on the, on, on the train from Switzerland to India, whether we like it or not, we're on that train. And unless you learn how to live in that environment, you're gonna have an increasingly difficult time. So where we find ourselves today is that both are really big, which is what makes it confusing, <laughs> because it's kind of hard to be one or the other, you right. have to do both. Right. And finding people who can do both, almost impossible. Mm -hmm. right? so, so that's why today is just incredibly confusing. So I think, I think the, you know, we're talking about YouTube stars, but then you have big Hollywood stars doing you know, TV shows for Netflix. At the same time, YouTube stars are succeeding and becoming really big. And it's like, how does all of this make sense? It's like, one is based on limited show space model. The other one is based on unlimited show space model. Mm -hmm. Completely different businesses, both really big. And I think anybody, if you're a storyteller in Hollywood, today is the best possible time ever because you have both of these options at your disposal. And, uh, and you can make money both ways. So to answer your question, because I don't want to get to a really long way, some people may not be good for this direct-to-consumer model at all, and they rather make a movie or a TV show and hand it over to a company just like they always used to, and the company, instead of a TV channel, instead of, I don't know, HBO, now it's Netflix, the creator doesn't do anything different than they've always done. They just make great art, give it to these guys, and those guys find the audience. Some say, I can find my own audience for the things that I do. And when I have my audience, I have much more leverage because I can leverage it into many different projects. I make money and I build my businesses. And there are plenty of examples you know, in the book on that. So uh, there's plenty of money to be made um, uh, if you own your audience. You pointed that out in um, some of the through the book that the partner program in 2007 yep. changed all that yeah. because now you saw the relationship between those parties as partners, not not you know oligarch and servants. In, they, in a sense, they they participated. Yeah. They were not just passengers. Yeah. The so, so exactly. So you know we have a partner program uh, now for a decade where we we pay uh, a majority of the revenue that we make to content creators. You know as they're generating uh, viewership for their content, and you know now it's a multi-billion-dollar business per year. So it's a lot of money that we're passing on to the to the creative community. And um, uh, they are much more empowered and much more difficult to deal with than Hollywood talent because they own their audience. Right. Because they say, no, Robert, you didn't give me my show. Or you didn't, you know, like on the right. TV network, you say, look, I, you know, this, this star is misbehaving. I gave them this show, and they're misbehaving now. Right? We can't say that because, because they'll tell you, no, no, no. I found my own audience. Yeah, it was on your platform, but I've, it's my audience. I did this myself, so do what I'm telling you to do. Right? Like it's it's much more difficult relationship because they're incredibly savvy, incredibly smart. They know their audience, they own their audience, and they just say, like, yeah, you, your platform helps me, but it's really me. Yeah. Right? And so so it's uh, our talent management is uh, much more intricate, and they're very popular, which means they can turn their uh, you know social following on against us anytime they want. Uh, so we have to behave really well. <laughs> and he knows this because he's on the other side of the equation earlier in your career, yes. where, the, where the, the, uh, the star or the person that controlled that star gave him the one finger salute when he asked him, can I talk to you? You know, yeah. and it was, yeah. so you, you do have that. But yeah. how did the smartphone amplify this whole process? I mean, the smartphone yeah. was like a seminal element of technology in the middle of it that changed both the the direction and amplified the process. Why is that? So? Yeah, th there's two things. One, that the smartphone became both a creation tool, but it also became a consumption tool. And, and the best way to think about it is, like, we all came home for many decades, and you would watch TV within certain times. In the morning, when you're having breakfast, you have the news on, and then in the evening, whether it's news or some, some shows, et cetera. Today, because of 
now you basically have TV in your pocket with you all the time, so you fill all the white spaces in your day with so much more consumption. And none of us realized how much consumption there actually is and how much white space there was. So we built up these large businesses side by side to the traditional businesses that still are there and haven't deteriorated. Right? So suddenly the white space created all this other value. And now what's happening is you see uh, the phones talking to the TVs at home, right? Because you can, with Chromecast, you can just send the videos from your phone to the TV or with AirPlay, et cetera. And so suddenly the phone is becoming not only the consumption device, but also your remote control. So it's becoming at the center of your life and, and center of your media consumption. Not for everybody yet, because you know, people haven't untethered from their set-top boxes, et cetera, but it's happening gradually. So the phone is, for many people, it's helping them create content. Uh, for huge amounts of people, it's helping them consume it. For us today, 68% of our consumption is on phones which is crazy, and, and still huge amounts of that is on Wi-Fi, so it's not like that people are running on the street watching things, They're even at home or in the office watching on Wi-Fi. So it's a massively huge uh, consumption device. In many, what we call next billion user markets, like in Indonesia, India, et cetera, that's the only device that people right. have, so that is a TV, that is the tablet. That that's an the amazing phone. difference, by the way. That's, uh, if they had to wire the world, it would take another 50 years yeah. to be able to do that. And uh, you light it up like this, so, so you have another billion people Right? And um, so, so you have to optimize for the phone and then just make sure that the phone talks to, to the big screen on the wall and makes everything seamless. And today you have additional element to it, which is now you have voice assistance being built into these platforms, which will then you know, eliminate eventually you having to touch things and you just speak you know, commands and it, you know, and it makes all this coordination possible. But we're in the very early stage of that. So, so the phone has just blown it all up, expanded the audience tremendously for everybody. Uh, who creates content and, uh, and, ex and expanded the amount of content that is actually flowing into the open platforms because now it's a creation tool as well. So you know, it's transformative. It, it, it's actually the key. There's several other very, very, very adroit and unique comments in it. One of the comments that struck me in the book was the ability to now not be marginalized for niche audiences who are very, it was separated, not only niche in their area, but separated by geography to yeah thousands of other audiences that could get the content. When I made a, make movies, it's made a movie now, which it's basically <coughs> for 50-year-olds. Now, to try to reach and make a movie for 50-year-olds is an act of daring do. I mean, it's really challenging. Um, the question is that what the internet and what YouTube has done is allowed to get more different kinds of voices reaching the audience for different kinds of voices. Um, how, do, how do you opine about what that means, and is it a value proposition for YouTube? Is it a value proposition for society? And do you see more of that aggregation uh, in, in terms of creating size of audience, which otherwise would not be able to be touched? Yeah, uh, so, so this touches on the point of unlimited shell space that I was highlighting before, uh, which, which means that because of the unlimited shell space, it's possible to create content for every single niche. You know, when, when mm -hmm. it's crowdsourced, it's, it's possible. And that's exactly what's, what's been happening, uh, which is why, you know, you see a lot of content on quilting on YouTube. Like, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody brought it to, uh, you know, CBS to pitch a show about quilting, you know, they'll probably say, okay, this no, is great. No, yeah. no, no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They wouldn't dare. <laughs> exactly, right? So that wouldn't work. Right. But they don't have to talk to us in order to do that because they can publish it, then it works, and then it grows from there. So what happens is you have these communities that, that get built on YouTube around uh, uh, subject interests, and then they grow, and then people suddenly feel like they have a place to belong, and 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 you know that is only possible when you have unlimited shell space and frictionless publishing platform, uh, which is what YouTube is, and then really what ha the reason that we're able to have uh, one and a half billion monthly logged in users, mm -hmm. right? So which is an right. incredible statistic, is because we collect all of these niches together. Right. And, uh, and, and basically, there is something for everyone to watch. And, and, uh, and I think that is what is radically changing media, is collection of niches together. And of course, we all want to have our big mainstream projects, et cetera. But it's really those who can collect the most niches will have the most scale. And if you have the most scale, you can do most interesting things because you're very uh, attractive to anybody who wants to publish content because you have the largest audience. You know, it's, it's a lot easier for us, you know, because we're producing original content ourselves, is, 
is go to talent and say, hey, would you like to create content for a local TV station called, and you can plug in any TV network in the world, or you, do you want to do it for a global uh, TV network called YouTube? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I want to do it for the global audience. Right. Like, All right, come on in, right? Then let's, let's figure it out. So, so I think we're very rapidly moving into a world that has a, uh, you know, it has global platforms, and you can publish into a billion people and, and, uh, and do really interesting things. You know, I, I've heard you talks and speaks and speak before, and you opine on a number of subjects that grow out of this, because it's interesting, more than just even wider than the book. But um, one of the things that's interesting is that most traditional media, media is a monologue. You make a movie, movie talks to people, that's, yeah. and, and that's it. And um, uh, the audience is, is essentially a passenger. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this medium, you have a dialogue going, both between the creative entrepreneur that makes it, the, mm -hmm. the, the maker, and other people who share this, yep. the, the viewing. And so it's a dialogue. Um, how, do you manage I'm that? I'm going to borrow that line. This is great. Monologue and dialogue. Okay. You're going to see us use that from here on. All right. <laughs> so when you make the audience a participant, are there any dangers in it? Like all of a sudden, no. you see this furor about something that's patently wrong or inaccurate or yep. such, and suddenly it's yep. a firestorm. And we know our president has a tendency to create firestorms. So the yep. question is, is what are, what are the perils, some of the perils in this? Is there, is there some kind of judicious thought process that people have to bring with this new tool called fire? Do you see all this gray hair? Yes. That's, that's the result of that. All right. <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> seriously. Uh, <laughs> um, so you, you're touching at like, I mean, you, you, you're just kind of stoking the right fire. Um, that's my job. Yeah, that's your job. <laughs> the, there's an incredible benefit from having open platforms because I, I can name statistics on how many jobs we create, you know, for the stream punks all around the world, how many millionaires we've minted, uh, you know, people who are, you know, women in Saudi Arabia who are not able to drive to work, um, you know, by themselves, working from YouTube, running their YouTube channels, uh, and, and making money from everywhere in the world, pulling the revenue in, and I have a story like this in every country. All of that is amazing. Uh, and then you have the flip side, which is what you're describing, which is uh, misbehavior of people on open platforms, because when you say anybody can publish, it means whether it's good people or bad people. Right? And uh, which means that every open platform has to deal with this and has to build up a series of systems and decision-making processes and collaborations with other open platforms to tackle these issues. And they're really difficult because when you operate on a scale like we do, 450 hours of video uploaded every single minute, these things, you can't handle all of that with people. You have to, uh, you have to train your uh, machines to, to do a lot of that. And the more it's context-based, the more subjectivity is in it, the bit more difficult it is to use machines. So you have to figure out what is it that you can use machines for, what is it that you need people for, yeah. how, how, you, uh, how your processes work, which organizations or subject experts you bring in to help you inform your processes and be part of them. So we've, we've wrestled with this for the last 10 years. We've been doing this. We have a large staff of dealing with it. And, um, and, and, the, the, uh, and like this year, we've made so much progress on it, more so than I would say in, in any other year. And, and it's, a, it's like a golf game. It will never be complete. Like, you'll never just be perfect and hole in one on every single hole. Uh, it's something that you just keep on getting better at because you constantly have more and more scale coming in that you have to deal with. So the scale challenge is always there. But it is, uh, it is ultimately a trade-off of open platform and, uh, and managing sort of the dark voices uh, that exist in the world and, and making sure that um, you know, we can take tougher stance on them without violating freedom of speech and some of the things that we like to have, you know, in, in our country. That's a great answer. Um, YouTube is built, or is built, on video advertising, but the media landscape has changed, and so you made a move towards subscription formula. Mm -hmm. You know, it, when you do that, the architecture, that architecture, there's risks and rewards. You're pine on, you know, because you, you, suddenly it looks like, I'm not saying it's like that, now we're moving from glory to gold, you know, that, that like every major institution figures, okay, now we got them on both ends. The artists, I'm making this up. Artists and audiences, how do we capture more revenue in the middle by, you know, by doing a, um, adjusting the model 
so that we can be more uh, financially rewarding to our shareholders. And when you look to the subscription model, it clearly has that calling. On the other hand, it really changes the relationship between the parties. Yeah. So, so um, what Peter's talking about is our subscription called YouTube Red, uh, which uh, provides you ad-free access to YouTube, plus original content that we're producing. And uh, so we actually did it with our creators in mind and with users in mind. We've, uh, we've had a lot of uh, requests from users all, all around the world who don't like watching ads. Now, the vast majority of people, they say that, and when they have to pay, then they don't want to pay. <laughs> uh, so, so we know that the advertising business will forever be you know, the, our largest business. But there is a segment of people who will pay to remove ads. And uh, from a creator standpoint, it makes a lot of sense because these are high value users. Mm -hmm. right? They're paying way more than what the ads would earn for them. So for us, this is more of a audience segmentation strategy rather than margin enhancement or anything like that. So we don't look at it from how do we enrich ourselves. We, we just looked at it at how do we, how do we bring a very high value audience to our creators? Because then if they're making more money, they're just creating more content from us and eventually we're making more money. So this is, everything is just like, I don't pay it forward, pay it forward, pay it forward so that, you know, this is a long game for us. You know, so, I, I might just interrupt yeah, because yeah, yeah. you've come from this other space, all right? Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's dissuade ourselves. You know the other space. Yeah. You know, is that really a Trojan horse for really called a distribution fee, ultimately? So what you really do is you have a, a methodology to provide another service, you segment your audience, and we'll do what the movie, television, and music business does and intercept a distribution fee in the center for providing access to this more elite audience. I'm not suggesting, yeah. I'm not suggesting bad behavior. I'm only suggesting yeah. that when it looks like a dog, it smells like a dog, and barks like a dog, it looks like it's a dog. Yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, YouTube Red is, is, we don't have any other desires other than capture as many people in the subscription in addition to our ad business, because it just, the more money you pay to the creative community, the more content you're getting back. That, that, that is the that is So the that's a pass-through, a lot of a pass-through. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all pass-through right now. Right. Okay. And, uh, and of course, eventually, you know, we want to make sure that we make some money out of it, but it really is all about how do we get the creative community to create more content for us, better and better content. If you, if you rewind 10 years back, YouTube was grainy home video pictures. That's really what it was. And horrible content, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and now you're, you're looking at John Oliver from HBO on YouTube in 4K. Right. right? Like, it's, uh, the, the leap has been tremendous. And you know, in, in places like India, we have you know movies and TV shows on YouTube because the TV networks are uploading it there because there's you know completely different model of consumption and monetization. So it's the the, the fidelity and the content quality itself, everything has just gone by leaps and bounds. And all of that's possible because we're paying out money every year, and it grows 50% year on year every year. So there's just this tremendous velocity. Two questions, and then we'll turn it over to the group to see what kind of questions you might want to uh, ask. But you have children? Two daughters, uh, 14 and 17. OK, so let me ask you a question. You've ever been sitting at the dining room table with two of their friends, and they're I said with, they're with, 14 and 17. They're not sitting with us anymore. Oh, forget. <laughs> <laughs> it's a few years ago, sitting at the, the, the table, and, the, and you, the children are there with a couple of their children, and you have a couple of adults with you there, and you're all talking. The children are sitting there going like this under, under the table. And uh, they're There's the white texting. space. They're texting. That's the white space. They're texting. Unfortunately, they're texting each other at the table, which is really crazy. But, but, but they're doing that. The smartphone and all this area is very addictive. Not habituating, yep. addictive. When yep. you leave home without that phone, your sphincters arrest. And you think, where is that phone? You know? Not your wallet, but that's the way it is. You have anxiety attack when it's being charged. I, I have a five-year-old grandson, six-year-old grandson, and a seven-year-old grandson, and they, it, it's, it's like third parent. It's, they, 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 they're just connected to it all, to, all the time. This is a larger question, somewhat outside the book, but you are gonna, you're making the most compelling narratives in the most compelling ways. You're not in charge of that process. But do you have any thoughts on your own uh, that, that presents another problem to society, the uh, just habituating, addictive nature the smartphones and the great content now through YouTube on it? Uh, so I would say the, 
addictive part comes from social media, so let's blame Facebook for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, but, um, so number one, I'll, I'll digress a little bit. The best way to deal with this at home is phones go on the table, face down on top of each other mm -hmm. uh, when you're having dinner, so nobody can touch it, nobody can look. Right. And our kids actually started to do it with their friends, right. which is really fun, so that's, that's a great rule. Um, uh, the other fun note on this I have is uh, I watched Jerry Seinfeld uh, about a month ago in, uh, in Vegas and he had a funny line on this which is that, you know, what's up with mo mobile phones, smartphones, the only, th it, it seems like the only smart thing in, in smartphones is the phone, right? That's the only thing that's getting smarter <laughs> right. and you're there just to take it from where it is to where it needs to be. And, and, and you just check in over there, and check in over there, and the phone, you're, you're just the vessel for, for the it's smartness true. of the phone. Um, no, it's, that's, it, a, that's, a, that's a cautionary it, tale. <laughs> think about artificial intelligence and robotics coming and machine learning coming down the road. You know, like, there's some real truth to that. Yeah. No, it's, it's a really funny bit. But the, uh, I, I think uh, my kids are so much smarter than I ever was at their age. It, it's unbelievable how much smarter they are, right? And it's, of course, because, you know, whenever I didn't know something, I asked my parents, they didn't know. It's like, why don't you go to the library and, and, and figure it out, right? And I was like, well, and I had to, like, walk an hour in snow to go to the library and, uh, you know, uphill both ways and, and all that. <laughs> and, uh, and my kids, they just, like, you know, go on Google, find the answers. And, and so their level of sophistication and smartness is really great. The thing that's happening, and I'm actually, uh, I actually have a different opinion on this completely. I actually think that this generation of kids is much better than we are. Like our generations were much more upwardly focused, like much more selfish generation actually mm -hmm. than our kids are. They're much more socially conscious and less materialistic. Uh, ownership means less to them because everything is a rental model anyway, right? Uber, and like you know, anything you can imagine, everything's moving to rental model. So they're they're much less materialistic and much more socially conscious. And I actually think schools teach quite a lot of this. So the, the credit doesn't really go to the parents. And, and um, they learn how to spot BS online. They see like, you know, so-and-so has 10 million subscribers or 10 million followers, but only, you know, uh, 500,000 like, likes on these things. It means they bought 8 million of these. They're inactive and it doesn't matter. So their opinions are not really good. So th they're incredibly savvy in these things. So I think we've struggled with this, like, you know, do you take the devices away and not allow them to use it? You can't because homework is online, so you take their computer away, like they can do their homework. Like the school communicates with them, all that. So it's really about constantly talking to them about what are the right things to do and, and, and right things not to do. You know, obviously, you, you saw that whole scandal at Brentwood, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and, uh, at the party, et cetera like social media, what's being recorded, et cetera. So I think you need to teach them these basics whenever it happens and point to those examples. But I think the sophistication they find themselves, they do go through periods of time where they're just completely overwhelmed and like trying everything. But eventually they learn it's just a massive time suck and they can't do it. And if kids are busy, if they do sports, if they have school, it's impossible for them to trade it all off. So they, they moderate it. So I think healthy do dose of parenting, uh, good schools that really teach them about sort of social awareness and, and, and uh, sort of something greater than the, just themselves. And all in, I, I view it really as a device that makes kids a lot smarter. So yes, there are negatives, but I think the positives far outweigh uh, what's there. And, I, I, and we just look at ourselves. Our kids are smarter than we are. You know, and you know, that's, that's, a, that's a good place to be. And that's a good place to leave our conversation because it's a very positive and thoughtful place. And I want you to know that obviously, you know, I read the book and I enjoyed the book. I'm a book reader, you. you know, I'm a book reader, and I enjoyed the conversation with you, and I think that you've um, opened up the windows to a lot of things that will cause a lot more conversation. So this, yeah. the end Thank of the book is the beginning of the conversation, yeah. which is a perfect YouTube framework. Mm -hmm. A few Thank questions, so just a few questions? Here. Yeah, it's about that time for questions. Just a quick reminder around here, questions start with a W or an H, and sometimes a D. They typically are okay. short. Only okay. Peter Guber okay. gets to ask follow-up questions, and there is no such thing as a two-part question. Hey, good morning. My name is Jeremy Fremont, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm curious, with the steampunks and everything that's happening right now with streaming and Facebook Live and Instagram, is it too late for new steampunks, steampunks to enter into the YouTube space and start their own channel and get subscriber base and build up to where 
the successes that a lot of these other people who have been on there for many years are at? So, so this is an excellent question. This is actually what we uh, constantly work on. Like when internally when we like plan for next year, we always look at what is our graduating class and who are the up and comers and how do we service them and how do we allow people to rise to the top. So there are things that we do in the UI where we have uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, we're featuring in our trending tab where we're treating artists on the rise and creators on the rise, for instance. So we're giving them like extra bump to the people who we see are doing incredible things and they deserve some spotlight. Uh, but it's absolutely never too late. Uh, we've been asking this question literally every single year. I've been there for seven years. So I did seven years at Netflix before and then seven years here. And every single year we've been asking the same question and every single year we're just bigger, which means bigger audience, which new guys are like able to reach heights that the previous guys were not able to do. Uh, there is always niches to, to reach. And also, uh, you know, some people get burnt out by doing it for too long, others take their place. It's actually, it's a very competitive field because there are newcomers all the time. So it's never too late to start and there's always new stories of people who, who've made it and the velocity is much faster too these days. I wanted to know, does age matter when you get into the YouTuber space? Does it matter that you may be a mature person? Does that matter? So that's, uh, that was my point number three for reason of writing the book, that age doesn't matter. And Jenny Doan is like the gold standard. Jenny Doan from the Missouri um, uh, star, film com uh, star Quilt Company is the perfect example of that. Um, she was in her 50s when she started her uh, YouTube channel. Uh, there's another great example, Alan de Baton, who is a uh, philosopher born in Switzerland, lives in London, who has this channel called School of Life, which is actually a philosophy school which has centers in, I believe, 11 cities around the world. And he now has a channel with 3 million subscribers he started two years ago. And, and it's, it's like, you guys should subscribe. Um, every few days, or uh, he'll have five-minute video on different subjects. Why do we get depressed? Uh, he, he just deals with uh, serious issues in a fun way in animations with his, you know, English accent voiceover. It's really entertaining, but you learn, and it's really fun. So it's never too late. It depends. You have to find what it is that you you're good at, and that will attract your audience to. Which is no different than any other storyteller, right? And you know, who made a movie or TV show, etc. You have to find like what what you excel at. And, and, and own it and, and if, you know, if you stay at it for a long time and you learn you know, how to do all the technical things, annotations and you know, end, end card and how to bring people back, how frequently you publish videos, what you, you look at your statistics, you see what resonated, you do more of that, it just becomes that kind of a game. It's never too late to start. Hi, thank you. Uh, just a quick um, uh, a, a, qu a question about the decision to locate uh, the, the, the campus in uh, Playa Vista and the importance of location and what you see is, is, is happening in Los Angeles in this, in this space. Yeah, so, so I actually think uh, Los Angeles is becoming an incredibly vibrant and interesting place. It always has been, but then sort of Silicon Valley kind of, I think, took a little bit of the glamour away in the last few years. And what's happening now is that um, Every company, it's like all the large companies, you know, largest market cap companies in the world, they all want to have some kind of a, a bigger outpost over here. And obviously, space is limited if you, if you want to do a lot of different things. Um, the weather is amazing. Uh, lots of creative talent. And there's not just creative talent, there are also engineers. We have 1,000 engineers working for Google in Venice. There are engineers working for Snapchat, et cetera. So now you, you start seeing LA to be this amalgamation of of uh, engineering and storytelling, which is amazing, right? Most other places, like I don't actually know another place that has that. There's no other place with the, with the merger of the poet and the engineer. This is really yeah. a very interesting yeah. time. Yeah. And, and, and that will only continue. And uh, so what's happening is you need to find a place where you can expand, right? Because if you, if you plan on expanding a lot. So for us, uh, we looked at Playa uh, as a place that there wasn't that much uh, quite a few years ago. And so there's tremendous uh, expansion opportunity. And if we go there, other people follow and all the services and everything gets built up around it. That's exactly what happened. So, um, you know, other companies move into Hollywood, right? Netflix, Viacom, et cetera. And that's revitalizing Hollywood like crazy. Uh, so I think you just start seeing, you know, and then Culver City is another one, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so it's all, uh, for us, Playa was the place with lots of space where we could achieve 
our uh, real estate objectives. We like the west side, it's close to the water. Uh, it's, you know, look, all of these things are important for attracting employees, right? Like if you're competing, okay, do you want to be in, in go to Bay misery, Area? misery yeah. or Los Angeles? Yeah. <laughs> or, but, well, sometimes Los Angeles is but, but it could be, you know, you, are you going to be in the Bay Area? <laughs> right. Or are you going to be in New York? Or are you going to be here? It's a, it's and a then, choice. Like, yeah, and where you are, where your commute, commute's going to be, et cetera. It's really convenient for, we have a lot of traffic for people, you know, whether it's media agencies or brands flying from New York. We're not that far from the airport, so whether people are on the way from the airport or on the way to the and airport. And technology <coughs> changed that since the old days. The yeah. old days, you couldn't, you couldn't do that. You had to go to New York. Yeah. Here, you could have all kinds of technology that yeah. put people together. That's right. So, uh, so yeah, so we're, you know, we're rebuilding the uh, Spruce Goose hangar. Uh, you know, Howard Hughes' hangar, which is fantastic, retaining all the wood, original wood on the inside. It's going to be fantastic. And we have a lot of space around there Great. to expand. We have the YouTube space right next to it. We have another building. Uh, next to it, so lots of jobs. So. All right. Hi. Uh, so in this world where everyone has their own voice and can say, you know, what's on their mind and, and free speech, how do you go about um, monitoring the content um, that's on YouTube and what is actually published versus, you know, what is essentially dangerous to yep. viewership? And no follow-up questions sure. or no two. Questions. Sure. Um, so, so th this goes to the issue that Peter asked about earlier, right? Like, how do we right. how do we deal with the open nature of YouTube? And we have this incredible thing called uh, uh, community flaggers, uh, which we, we've had for a long time and have developed it, where our users are flagging videos uh, that they deem inappropriate, and they have no idea what our policies are. They just their own subjectivity. Just tell them, I want to give YouTube feedback that this shouldn't be on, in my opinion, or they might want to take a look at. So, so users are doing that at a tremendous scale. Then uh, we have uh, sort of trusted flaggers, people with whom we work closely. They're not our employees, but they really care about it the same way that people care about uh, Wikipedia pages. You know, there are people who are looking after mm -hmm. those. So, so we have a group of uh, folks doing that. And then, so that's sort of the next layer of, you know, and they understand the rules and they understand the policies much better. And then. You know, so I'm kind of describing the funnel. And then we have our own employees who, after it's been flagged by the community, by the, the trusted flaggers as well, then our staff looks at it. And before it gets to any of this, our systems, you know, our machine learning algorithms are running, and they're basically running against the policies that we have to, uh, to remove content that violates law or it incites hate and violence and things like that. So it gets automatically um, removed. So we have this sort of mix of uh, machines and people, both crowdsourced, uh, as well as trusted, as well as internal. So it's a very intricate system. And, and, and like I, any open platform will, will have to contend with this. We have time for one more question. Um, so with the stream punks being uh, homegrown on YouTube, in regards to celebrities that have maybe made their name in, on other platforms, maybe more traditional platforms, what advice would you give them uh, for being successful on YouTube. Yeah, so, so we actually have a program for celebrities who, who may not be, uh, uh, you know, they may not have their own YouTube channel, uh, but they may be incredibly popular because people are uploading content that has them in it or they talk about them on YouTube, et cetera. And, uh, and, and we have a program to onboard them to YouTube and help them grow their channels. Great example, the greatest example of that is Kevin Durant, uh, <laughs> who uh, is, is amazing. <laughs> And uh, so he's in our program, and we're actually uh, hand-holding him and, and his uh, business partner through building up a large YouTube presence. Because Rich what, Kleiman. Oh, Rich, Rich Kleiman, Kleiman right. yeah. And, and they've been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they're like our bright, shining example right. of how you take a star and bring them onto YouTube. Just, and, let, them, just let them practice more. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, our, our pitch to them is on YouTube, because you don't just consume things in the feed, which is what you do on social media. You just consume in the feed, which, which means it either happens today, or maybe tomorrow, and that's it. Then it's forever gone. On YouTube, we have two modes of discovery. One is in the feed, but the other one is our recommendations, which are incredibly powerful because people are coming for the video. And which means that people are discovering content from, which is not just new, just from today, but also library content. And there's massive amounts of consumption of that. So if you really care about your presence 
and you want to make sure there's comprehensive presence of you of content that you've uploaded as well as other fans uploaded that you can bring into your channel then you should build up a YouTube channel and then what we're doing is we're building other features such as links to if you're an artist to ticketing through Ticketmaster to, you know to buy you know to sell concert tickets or to merchandising you know when people are selling t-shirts and other things and and what you should do is make YouTube the center of your social media so that you point everything else to your YouTube channel because that is where you will have most complete presence, most representative of you, whether it's your own uploaded content or your fans that you, that you curate in there. And, and then you have all of your other commercial opportunities that come from there, whether it's working on uh, big original content with us because we like to do people who have big following on YouTube because then we can launch it on the channel that has millions of people it kind of de-risks the discovery process for it. Um, so it's easier for us to spend money on that. Uh, or whether it's doing interesting branded opportunities with large brands who want to be associated with you, or whether you're just converting the traffic to transactions through the means that I described. So we think invest for any star to invest in their YouTube channel is an incredibly uh, great long-term plan because it will always be there. It will keep on generating traffic because we you know, sixty percent of all watch time on YouTube is generated through recommendations. So it's not like in the feed that people scroll and buy. This is you about you, and and we're driving you know interest to you. So uh, we have a program for celebrities that we work on, and uh, we have an active outreach. And then we're you know we have different types of celebrities that we work with. But you know Kevin's our, he's the poster child. Thank you very very much. You thank you so much, today. Peter.